you read Michael's piece. I was, uh, and, and you, you. Well, I've been following no. um, a lot of the different aspects of what happened here, and I think a major part of it, and as we talk about the Democrats, I sometimes feel like we over talk about that, and then it leaves out other reasons why this election was lost by the Democrats, and that would be disinformation. And Michael, you were writing about. You know, why doesn't anyone talk about the real reason Trump won? And you're talking about right wing media in part. Can you explain? Sure. Um, and look, there were immediate reasons that had to do with inflation, the economy, and so forth. But what I was trying to draw readers' attention to with this column is a longer historical problem that I've watched develop over the last 30 years, which is the growth tremendous growth in size mm -hmm. and influence of the right-wing media in this country. When we talk about the media, usually in shorthand, we say the media this, the media that, as if it's one thing. Uh, but actually in this country, we have two medias, and I think it's very important for people to understand this. There's mainstream media, which is, you know, the networks and the New York Times and so forth, and then there's a right-wing media. And when we think of right-wing media, we all think first of Fox News, but it's much larger and vaster than that. There are other cable networks. There are, there's talk radio, right-wing talk radio, which is everywhere across this country. There's right-wing Christian radio. Uh, right-wing networks have bought up uh, uh, local television, local radio, some local newspapers. And then there's this whole world of social media and podcasters uh, that is just absolutely vast. Yeah. Add it all up, it's tremendously influential, and it really does more than the mainstream Stream media these days, I think, Mika, set the terms yeah. of our political conversation. And do you think that uh, uh, is are we also talking about disinformation or just a lean to the right in terms of how they the the point of view that is presented? Well, sure, there's both. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, they the, another thing that gives this right wing media network such power is that it speaks with one voice. And that voice right. says to regular people that the Democrats hate you and the Democrats want to turn your son into your daughter and, and Donald Trump is your last line of defense against this madness. Now, to go back to identity politics, I just want to speak to that really quickly. I, I've been writing about that since the mid-1990s, and, and, and it is a political problem for the Democrats. Now, you know, I see, uh, to be honest, I, I, I see trouble coming for transgender Americans probably mm -hmm. uh, particularly transgender people in the military, I think the Democrats mm -hmm. need to stand up for those Americans. And I think most Americans aren't bigoted and don't want to see people be treated the way I fear they might be treated. Having said that, at election time, Democrats and these interest groups need to be smarter about the way they talk about these things. And, and uh, you know, you can't you just shouldn't ask people to tick off, you know, uh, publicly every item on your litmus test list, right. you know, yeah. and make them do that. As I, we say, as I we say here all the time, two things can be true at once. The Democratic Party can protect the rights of, of people that others may want to stamp on. Uh, at the same time, they have to have reasonable, rational policy positions that do two things at once. I always, on, on the issue of transgender Sports. The overwhelming majority of Americans, as I said last hour, do not want men who transition after puberty competing against uh, young <laughs> girls uh, and young women. Nobody, 85% of Americans agree with that. Uh, but as Spencer Cox, the Republican governor of, of Utah, said after right. uh, they, they vetoed a bill, he was like, come on, guys. We have three transgender athletes in the state of Utah. I think we can figure this out so we don't punish these three students. So, yeah, I, I, I think we, we all agree there. I do want to ask this question, and I, 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 found, I, found, your, um, I found your piece fascinating. Uh, we do look at the misinformation all the time, the disinformation uh, that, that's coming from a lot of these sources, just deliberate disinformation that's coming from the sources. That said, that doesn't explain black voters not coming out in Detroit. Black voters not coming out in uh, Milwaukee. Black voters not coming out in Philadelphia in the numbers they came out in mm -hmm. uh, uh, back in, in 2020. Reverend Al had told us earlier, uh, about a month earlier, that he went to Detroit. And there just wasn't the interest there uh, among a lot of black voters. They, they, they were not excited about this campaign, were not excited about voting. 
and he saw trouble coming a month ahead of time. And so that's not because they've been watching Newsmax and are upset, right? No, it's not. It's not. I would still say, Joe, that I, I you know, discuss, look, people go to the grocery store and they experience what they experience. And the ba the basket of groceries that used to be $80 is $115. I yes. experience that myself. Yeah. I'm not a rich guy. You know, <laughs> I see it. I go to the grocery store. So all that is true. At the same time, I think our debate about the economy is set in large part by this right wing media. And, and, you know, they pick the facts that will support uh, their interpretation of the world. And um, and you just watch come noon on January 20th. These outlets, they're going to start picking the great facts about the economy. And within about two weeks, we're going to have a booming Trump economy, according to that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to be turned around. And I'm sure on the other side, there will be people talking about the Great Depression that is coming on the, from, from the far left. I mean, our economy, our economy is, is the envy of the world. There are people, though, right now who are struggling with housing prices, mm -hmm. as we said on Friday, with gas and grocery prices. And that is a really big issue. Well, and as Kamala Harris said, too, I mean, she didn't yeah. not debate on these oh, right. issues. Oh, no, she no, was exactly. actually putting a plan for first time homeowners. But, I, but I wouldn't be we need to be careful not yeah. to sort of over edit on what happened. I want to be clear here. And Michael, and I'll invite everybody else really quickly. We need to go to break. But it is really important. I, for, for me, at least personally, to say this, there's always Monday morning quarterbacking. It's so easy. If a candidate wins by one, then they're landslide, you know, uh, Johnson. If they lose by one, they're the biggest loser of all time. I want to be very clear. Kamala Harris, I thought, came in. She hit her marks. Everything. She did really well with her launch, had those great rallies. She did great in the debate, so so well that Donald Trump didn't want to debate her a second time. She, she, she did a lot of things right. Uh, now, Mika and I have been having this debate on the week, uh, over the weekend. Mika thinks that Joe Biden may have done better. I don't think so. I think that this was a Democratic Party problem, and whoever was in that slot was going to have problems over peace, prosperity, and yes, I will say it, with, with the wokeness and the extreme stuff from the, from the far left. So, Michael, uh, I just wanted to get that out because we keep talking about this. Usually a candidate is blamed, uh, but, but my feeling is, Kamala hit all of her marks, short campaign. She did what she could do. There were just underlying problems that she couldn't get past any more than Joe Biden could have gotten past. I think swing voters just wanted to punish the party of inflation. And, and it, it's really kind of that simple. Uh, all the other issues yeah. you're talking about factored in, but I think that was far and away the main one. Yeah. Uh, I think she ran a pretty good campaign, uh, in, in many ways a very good campaign, and it seemed it, I was wrong, because it looked to me at the end like she had momentum and she had the feel of a winner. And, and you know, yeah. his, he was being desultory and, and strange yeah. in his public appearances, but none of that ended up mattering. I do think, though, that when in focus groups, voters can't answer the question, what do the Democrats stand for economically? And they just can't really answer it. That's, that's an issue. That's yeah. an issue. And Editor and of the New Republic, Michael Tomaski, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Come back. Let's talk about the Beatles. We're going to look for an excuse <laughs> to talk about the Beatles. Yeah, the, it, Michael's so right. So many things didn't matter. Crowd sizes, let's say it again, they, they do not matter. I always tell this story in 2012 about how uh, we got a call from Mitt Romney's campaign in Pennsylvania. Joe, oh, listen to the crowd. We got 35 that we're going to win. They didn't. It's the same thing here. Crowd sizes didn't matter. Endorsements. I've always said endorsements don't matter. That certainly was proven to be the case here. So many things just don't matter. But about Joe Biden, you think he could have done better? Um, I, I, I don't. I do. I think that there is a chance he could have. I think the biggest issue was that Democrats found themselves in a place where they had to separate themselves from the Joe Biden presidency. He was very proud of his presidency. He had a lot to say about what he had done and where it was going. And for some reason, the, the Democrats started adopting the far rights of Joe Biden's uh, presidency was the worst presidency ever. I, I don't know how that happened. I don't know how the most accomplished presidency in 
modern presidential history can be all of a sudden turned into, you know, the worst presidency ever. I think that was a problem. I think that um, all of the things that he accomplished were leading this nation in the right direction and more needed to be done. And if he was able to continue with that, Things might have been different, but you know, I already had said that long ago. Yeah, well, you know, and I also think Kamala ran a freaking incredible campaign she, and did she everything well. she could. I, I, I think, though, the, the, the thing is, yes, he, he passed more bipartisan legislation than anybody uh, in uh, coming out in of this COVID, century. Coming out of Trump. Co co coming out of COVID. Our economy, uh, despite the fact that there are people still suffering, uh, the, the envy of the world, strongest uh, that it has been relative to the Rebuilt rest of the NATO. world. since NATO. Since 1945, NATO and Expanded our alliances. Expanded it. Sorry, having fun. <laughs> NATO and our alliances in Europe, stronger than ever. Uh, you talk to foreign policy leaders, of course, uh, in Asia, they will tell you the United States has built a, a, a stronger defense around China. Uh, against China aggression uh, than they've had in uh, in ages. Uh, there are a lot of really positive things. The biggest problem was he couldn't articulate his defense effectively enough. We saw that in the debate, and that got in the way. Still, Evan. Yeah.